The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me now in your copy of Holy Scripture to the fifth chapter of Matthew's Gospel. We're in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5, we'll begin with verse 13 and read through verse 20. Matthew chapter 5, beginning with verse 13. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O oh God, we pray for ears to hear, ears that hear your words, not the ones I put in the way, eyes to see your way, hands and feet that move to do your work, hearts open to receive and to share the love that you so freely give. We pray in Christ's name, amen. I was in the seventh grade registering for the 8th grade. In Enterprise, the way that worked, we only had one 7th grade junior high. You registered and then you split into two. One was called Dolphin Junior High. That's where all the, the folks who own khaki pants went. And uh, Old Junior, Enterprise Junior High. It's not there anymore. None of the schools I went to, actually, uh, they just couldn't keep them up after I left. They're all gone. Uh, Old Junior is just a patch of ground now. But we were going into the 8th grade and I remember having back then to, to register on a piece of paper and deciding what elective I was going to take. Now, to be fair, there weren't a lot going into the eighth grade, and so I wound up choosing beginner band. And so when the next year came, I had almost forgotten that I had signed up for beginner band until that first week of school when I walked into Mr. Ford's class in the band room just behind the gym at Old Junior. That first week was all about sort of learning the basics, uh, what type of instruments it takes to make a band, brass, low brass, wood woodwinds, percussion, those sorts of things, how to read music, a treble clef, a bass clef, that sort of stuff, what scales meant. We, we did that, and of course, scheduling when we would watch Mr. Holland's opus. I think if you're in the band, you, back then you had to, to watch that movie. At the beginning, of, at the end of that week, though, I, I remember uh, Mr. Ford had put a tape in. Do you all know what a tape is, a VHS tape? goes into a thing called a VCR. Uh, those will be collectible soon. Uh, he put one into the, into the tape and started playing just to, I forget even what it was, but while it played, he would call each of us over to his desk in the corner of the room so that he could ask or assign an instrument. And so uh, they would all, he'd start calling us alphabetically, and that's how I wound up toward the end of the role being a trombone player. When it was my turn to decide, Mr. Ford called me over to his desk, but by then all the cool instruments were taken. Trumpets, saxophones, we had three drummers, we didn't need any of those things. And I knew, I knew I didn't get, want to get stuck playing the tuba, because people like me, that look like me, wind up having to carry the big tuba around. And, and frankly, yeah, Ms. Jackson knows it's true. <laughs> you don't have to take this as advice if you don't want to. But I knew uh, Mr. Ford would say, he's kind of big, he can tote a tuba. So I didn't want to play a tuba. So when he asked, when I thought about the trombone, the, which he said it cool, the slide trombone. Honestly, I thought, man, that sounds all right. I'd heard trombone solos before. I'd never really heard a tuba solo. 
I'd seen trombone players in bands on TV using the wrong end of a plunger to make cool sounds on the trombone. So I agreed. I'd play the trombone. And then he told me we didn't have one to rent. So my mom found, managed to find one maybe in a pawn shop, a cheap used Jupiter trombone. I found out later, especially after it broke from its base, that tr Jupiter wasn't really the best brand for a trombone. But in the two years that I played that trombone, I, I was pretty good. I made it up to second chair just behind my friend Adele, who was far superior than the rest of us at anything, I think. I was moved up to concert band my beginning year where I borrowed a pair of two small black shiny shoes, got on a bus, and went and played in a competition in Troy where we did not win. Um, I even got to play a few concerts uh, at the junior high where I even had a solo. We played Beethoven's Ninth, like we did this morning, and I even played a little solo on a piece called Low Brass Boogie as a trombone player. I was a trombone player. But if you were to hand me one right now, I'm not sure I'd remember how to hold it. I'm not sure I'd remember how to blow my lips just the right way in the mouthpiece or uh, just right to hit a B flat in closed position or how to hit fifth position. I'm sure I wouldn't even know where that is anymore. But I was, I was a trombone player. It's funny how we can pick up a skill like that, isn't it? And, and uh, some knowledge, some identity we have, how some things like that we can pick up, maybe fool around with it for a little while and put it down and lose it all together, not even be an identity anymore. In fact, before now, I bet none of you even knew, some of you didn't even know I played the trombone. It's interesting how there are these identities we have in our lives we can pick up and put them down and never revisit them again. But can we do, so, do that so easily with our faith? with our public witness as Christians? I don't think so. You see, our identity as people of faith, as a person of faith, as a believer, as a Christian, isn't exactly something you can take off at the end of the day and hang in the closet until you need it again. It isn't something you can leave on the table in the foyer or the bulletin when you're done with it. You can't sneak it out the side door, into the parking lot, through the back door of your house, hoping no one saw you. No, in fact, your public witness as a Christian is something you show, something you take with you, whether you make a conscious effort to do it or not. And maybe that's why, that's why in these familiar words to so many of us from the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Do you ever notice that? Jesus doesn't say, you should be the salt of the earth. Jesus doesn't say, uh, you, you should be the light of the world. You can be the light of the world. You must be. You are equipped to be. You are called to be. No, what does he say? You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world, whether you mean to or not. And your existence as such is not conditional. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. You can't pick it up today and sit it down tomorrow. It's who you are, salt and light. Now, a lot of hay has been made on this passage, on these two metaphors of salt and light. So I don't want to add to them except to say this, that salt and light are things both recognized by their presence, as well as their absence. I mean, think about it. Do you ever take a bite out of your lunch and say, you know what this needs? Paprika. <laughs> you know what this, this bread needs? They should have put a little more baking soda in it. No, what do you say? You know what this needs? Salt. It's not there, but you know it by its presence. You know when you need a bit of salt. You also know when you've had too much salt, you know when the fry cook went a little crazy, just shaking the salt shaker over them hot french fries, right? making it snow, wasn't that pretty? Yeah. You know. The same is true of light. It's recognized for its presence and the lack of its presence. Think about it. When you walk into a dark room, what do you do? You turn on a light. You reach for your flashlight. 
Or, as most of us probably do now, what? You reach for your phone and there's a button or an app. You turn on a light. But what do you do when the, light, when, when the room's too bright? Can you turn on the dark? Do you have an app on your phone, say, make dark and shine the darkness anywhere? No. Light is known for its presence and its absence. The only thing that's dark is an absence of light. Salt and light are known by their presence and their absence. And the same can be said of our public witness as Christians. It's known by the presence or absence of righteousness. Not by whether or not we turn it off or on. Not by whether or not we decide to display it today and not tomorrow. It's there. That's why Jesus says in the same way, let your light shine before others. That's not turn it on and saying, let it loose, it's there. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. It's not about bragging on yourself, look how much light I've got. It's not about proving your righteousness before others. It's not about saying, look at how much more light I have than you. It's about shining the light of Christ within you upon the paths of others so that they may recognize the truth of who God is in you. And that's not necessarily, it's not necessarily what you may think it is. I remember when I first became a believer, hanging around churches, listening to sermons, going to Sunday school. It wasn't long before I started to hear somebody, some folks start talking about going witnessing. Y'all remember folks saying that, going witnessing? In fact, I seem to recall there was a line on our offering envelope, a line on the Sunday school report, especially reserved to mark the number of people to whom one had witnessed that week. If you're unfamiliar with the notion, basically the idea was that a person was supposed to intentionally go up to a stranger, preferably, and engage them in a conversation about their faith, hoping to win their soul for the Lord. Now, I don't don't mean to make light of that idea at all. But I believe one of the things missing from our culture is honest engagement and real conversations about our faith, public discourse about the difficulties and delights of one's decision to follow Christ, not just this formulaic, transactional, let me tell you, let me give you my sales pitch for my faith and chalk it up as witness. I do think, however, that we are only fooling ourselves if we think for one second We are not witnessing to the world whenever we aren't engaging in such conversations. That we aren't witnessing when we don't mean to be. We are. Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world, and you just can't turn it off. You see, friends, you and I are always on. Always carrying with us the gospel, the reality of who God is in Christ Jesus. You and I are always witnessing to the world that needs so desperately to know that there is hope. That there is light overcoming the darkness. That there is love in the midst of so much fear and division. You and I, we are the counter narrative to the culture story that there isn't enough for everyone. You and I, we are counter, we are the counter narrative to the notion that there isn't enough room for everyone, that there isn't enough love for everyone. We are the light of Christ, shining on a dark world, made dark not by the encroaching of darkness, but by those who are still holding back their own light under the bushel baskets of self-righteousness and fear. We are the light of the world. That's what we are. It's our very being. Jesus said so. We don't have to earn it. We don't have to pretend like we've got it all figured out. What's the most perfect source of light there is? No, not at all. You are the salt of the earth. You you are the light of the world. You'll figure this out, Jesus said. We are witnesses to the ultimate light and love of Christ in the world. But don't be confused by Jesus' words that come after this. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've come not to abolish, but to fulfill, he says. Not one stroke, not one, not one jot or tittle, not one I, not one cross on the T will be taken from the law until all is accomplished. And then he says, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments, teaches others to do the same, will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. 
Whatever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus, folks, is not claiming here some, some rigorous adherence to some doctrine of inerrancy. Jesus is not saying that all of the Bible doesn't go away now. He's not saying that there's still this strictness to the law. In fact, I would argue that in many ways such an idea is too small. It's too, too limiting in the full scope and power of what Jesus is getting at here. For Jesus isn't trying to say the whole Bible is literally true and therefore every verse can be used like a quiver, an arrow in the quiver or a bullet in the chamber to cast judgment upon some poor ignorant soul. Heaven forbid. No, when Jesus says, I've come not to abolish but to fulfill, what he means is he's come to literally fill out the law. To peel back the layers. This is what's at the heart of it. This is what it means in the first place. Showing us the thing behind the thing, as some of us say. You may recall, maybe you've heard before, a few pages later on in Matthew's Gospel. A time when a, a lawyer, an expert in the Mosaic law, the Torah, that's the first five books of, of the Bible, the Old Testament. This expert in the Torah came to Jesus and said, Teacher, what is the greatest commandment? This particular lawyer was trying to set Jesus up, see if he'd have the wrong answer, but Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, but he doesn't stop there. A second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then Jesus says this sentence. Same gospel these words come from. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. The whole thing. You want to know what it means to come to fulfill the law? Love God and your neighbor as yourself. On these two, everything else hangs. The entirety of the law, the heart of the scriptures, the thing behind the thing, the summation of the whole works of scripture is this. Love God and your neighbor as yourself. In these two commandments, Jesus says, we find the culmination of the law and the fullness of righteousness. It's not about finding every little proof text to prove you're better than somebody else. It's not about finding every passage of Scripture so that you can draw lines and create circles. Love God and your neighbor as yourself. I think that's why Jesus' words at the conclusion of this text can be somewhat confusing and maybe at best frightening, intimidating at worst. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. We are salt and light, Jesus says. But in order to enter the kingdom of heaven, we had better be more righteous than the scribes, those who knew the scriptures forwards and backwards, those who read and interpreted it even for the priests, those individuals who had given their lives to the transcribing, the translating, and the transmitting of Holy Scripture. We are salt and light, but in order to get into the kingdom, we had better outrank the Pharisees in our righteousness. Pharisees who, despite our modern Christian demonization of their very name, were lovers of both the written scriptures and the oral traditions that gave it life. They were vocational clergy, not clergy. They were not vocational clergy, not compensated religious leaders. They were volunteers, lay people, with an extraordinary commitment to the words of the scriptures and the upholding of its teachings. Unless our righteousness exceeds theirs, Jesus says, we don't get in. Now, don't try, don't try to make your mind up that Jesus is sarcastic here, that Jesus is calling them phonies, hypocrites, just play acting. No, I think Jesus is somewhat sincere in drawing attention to the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. However, I believe Jesus is also still calling us to a higher righteousness a righteousness that is not found in the ways one commits himself or herself to the private, self-kept practices of religion. After all, it is this sort of righteousness, this religious righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, that Jesus outlines sometime later in Matthew, chapter 25, verses 41 through 45, in the parable he tells there, 
He will say to those at his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. And they will also answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? He will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. You see, in this parable, these are those who had hoped their righteousness would be found in their personal private faith, in their knowledge of the law, and their commitment to religion. They are not unlike the two characters from one of Jesus' most well-known stories in the Gospel of Luke. When a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. But now, by chance, a priest had been going down that road. A priest, one in the service of the temple, one who made sacrifices, one who knew the law of the Lord and wore the vestments and kept himself clean, was going down that road. And when he saw him, this man beaten and left for dead, passed by on the other side, not, not out of unkindness, but because he was a priest. He could not touch an unclean man. And unsure of where he was from, seeing the blood on his skin pass by on the other side because the law told him to. So likewise, Jesus says, a Levite, when he came to this place and saw him pass by on the other side. Why not? Because of his contempt for the man. Because the law said, don't touch him. He may be unclean. Pass by on the other side. Maybe you know the rest of the story, how a reviled Samaritan comes to the rescue, defying the expectation of Jesus' audience. Not because this priest nor the Levite came to help, after all. They were simply following the letter of the law and not risking uncleanness, holding on to their own understanding of righteousness. But because this unrighteous Samaritan is a hero, the one who refuses to acknowledge what so many in Judea knew to be the truth of the law, is the one to emulate. The Samaritan, this example of righteousness. Jesus says that's how you exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees and the scribes. Not by sticking strictly to the law, but by seeking the way of love. Friends, the only way our righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees is when it becomes righteousness lived out in public witness. In the public witness of the love of God and the love of others. That's the ultimate fulfillment of the law. That is the ultimate expression of the gospel. The ultimate witness any of us can give to the world. We can walk up and down the highway with picket signs in one hand and a bullhorn in the other, shouting verses of scripture at the cars that go flying by. We can make post after post after post on social media claiming our allegiance to Christ and our self-righteousness. We can put signs in our yards, stickers on our cars, pins on our lapels, crosses around our necks, scripture on our t-shirts, and Bibles in every room in the house. But the scribes and Pharisees can do that. We are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. We are called to a higher order of righteousness. One not found in our own accomplishments, not one found in our own self-righteousness, but one grounded in the fulfillment of the law, the fullness of the gospel, to love God and others. And that's something we cannot keep to ourselves. I'm reminded of a story I heard once when an old evangelist ran into a Catholic monk in an airport. They had gotten on the train connecting between terminals. The monk stood there. The evangelist was there next to him. And to this evangelist, who believed in in what we call the old-time religion, this monk was a Catholic and therefore not a true born-again Christian. And so planning to witness to this monk, the evangelist walks over to him and says, Brother, are you a Christian? The monk simply said, yes. So the evangelist continued, have you been washed in the blood? Have you been baptized, brother? The monk said, yes. 
Well, the evangelist figured he had the right question now. He had the one to expose the monk's true identity as a reprobate Catholic, a sinner in need of the real salvation of God. So he asked him, Is Jesus your personal Lord and Savior? And the monk smiled, looked up at him and said, No, I like to share him. May we seek to share Christ. May we seek to love and to share the love of Christ. To live into our identity as salt and light in the world. To do what Christ calls us to do. To love God and love our neighbor as ourselves. May we share Jesus. May we share the love of Jesus. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit. Lord, as we come now to this time, we pray for your presence to move among us, to speak to us, God. Lord, to call us into this higher way of righteousness that is found in the fullness of your love. Help us, Lord, and give us strength to share that love. For, Lord, we know we are witnesses to this world, whether we mean to be or not. So, Lord, give us strength and compassion. Help us to hear the calling to be your witnesses. Here in this place, as we leave this place, in our homes, and, Lord, to the rest of this earth and world, as we are salt and we are light. Be with us, Holy Spirit, now we pray in Christ's name. Amen.